I definitely didn't choose to be in a wheelchair. But now that I've been given almost a second opportunity, and it just means that I have to be in a wheelchair, it's kind of something that I've had to accept. Make the most out of the opportunity that I have now. I'm still here, I'm still alive, like, I'm still a person. It's a real weird feeling of being lost and not being able to find yourself. It's like a balloon. You keep filling that balloon up with your feelings and your emotions and you wait for that balloon to pop. And once that balloon pops, you kind of feel like you're floating and you don't know how to get yourself down. I'm Jack Brown, I'm 21 and I'm from Palmerston North originally. T11, T12 paraplegic, which is basically a complete sever of the spinal cord, which means that I'm left with pretty much little to none feeling in my legs. Dad's in the army, been in the army for 30 years now. Um, so we grew up in army housing. And then when I was about nine, ten, my parents separated and then I moved into Palmerston North for a couple of years. I was actually kicked out of school when I was 16. Being a rebellious teenage boy that didn't really want to follow the rules, I went to a Catholic school and didn't really follow their values. Like I'd rather be out playing sports or doing something with my mates than playing PlayStation kind of thing. Like. It just wasn't really my thing. I just wanted to get out there, do something active, and do something with my hands. My dad brought a house in Sampson, and Leon and Ian ended up getting a house next door to us to renovate, and that's where we met them. They were actually our neighbours. We live in Inglewood. Um, I grew up here in terms of uh, 10k towards the mountain. We refer to, it, to him as our foster son, and I mean, we've done that pretty much it's not since day dot quite, but I mean, you know, since he came up here. He's a very likeable person. Um, I think you guys would have noticed that uh, medium in terms of, you know, he's, he's very able to sort of get on terms with people in the sense that he relates well to other people on a whole lot of different levels. Um, and I think that sort of, you know, charismatic likableness um, shows through a lot. Morning, mate. I've worked with Van for like five years now, so I kind of know what he expects or know what he wants. So a lot of the time it makes it pretty easy. Um, and he's a pretty chilled out guy, so. Swing, what I normally do is get the, grab the top one and then loop it under the bottom one yeah. and then just run it to there. And then as soon as you open that gate, they should just Coming out here, hopefully. It, it might be easier to... He's like a dad at the same time as a boss, at the same time as a workmate, so it's a real cool relationship that we have together. Sweet. How was that? <laughs> it's basically the only thing I've ever done for work. I started working for them six years ago when I was living at home with my parents and then moved up here when I was 16 with them and it's just been farming ever since, so yeah, love it. Fencing's a big a big challenge, um, trying to get the standards in the ground and the gates. 
because not every gate's as easy. And we've got bungee gates and the handles kind of go flying everywhere sometimes, so that makes it definitely a lot more challenging. They can be pretty pushy some days. I use this here mainly around the cow shed. Um, doesn't go too well out in the paddock, but around the cow shed and when I'm doing stuff that needs to get dirty, so yeah. Beforehand, I was a lot taller than the cows, um, whereas now the cows are the same height as me, so I kind of get pushed around a bit more, so I just have to be careful of that. One full six is green. When I was about 12, 13, I had a bit of a struggle and started seeing counselling and stuff like that, but kind of decided to bottle my emotions up because I didn't know how to deal with them. Part of the problem was, is I seen mental health as a weakness and that if I was to talk to somebody about it, it wasn't manly and that if I was to accept it, then it was a problem. I got to the point where I was hurting so much and the only way I could find myself to be happy was to remove myself from the situation. It's just a typical day. Come inside and then just kind of just chilled out. Didn't really know what I was thinking. And then went outside and it was about 10 o'clock that I went out maybe nine o'clock, and just kind of just started driving. And I just drove around for about an hour, hour and a half, and then ended up parking up underneath the shopping centre in town. And sat there for about 20 minutes. I can remember waking up in New Plymouth Hospital and it was a real weird feeling because this may sound crazy, but no one knows what happens when you die. And I was so convinced that I died that I was in what someone would call heaven and I'd, I'd gone to that place. And no one could prove to me that you couldn't have your family next to your hospital bed there. And it took quite a while for me to come to the fact that I was actually still alive and that the family was actually at my bedside and everything was still just normal life. And that's when I realised that it was permanent and it was for life. It was really hard because basically I went into it with a thousand problems that I thought and then to pretty much find out that I had 10,000 more was Definitely the hardest time in my life. Like, it was, it pretty much crushed me completely. All right, so Dick's stepmom, um, they've got three acres in Sanson and they keep some cattle. So effectively, they'd ring up at odd times saying, you know, what do I do with this sheep? What do I do with this cow? Um, so I got up in the morning of the 28th. And I had a message from her saying, ring me urgently, um, whatever time it is. So probably, you know, 10 to 5 in the morning, I rang up and said, you know, what's going on? And she said, oh, Jack's had a, you know, there's been a car crash and he's, um, he's broken his back and they don't think he's going to walk again. I uh, got back to the shed, shut the gate, came inside, woke Leanne up, said, this is what's happened, you need to go into the hospital.
Jack was um, strapped down to a board with a big head collar and um, tubes everywhere, and we were in intensive care. Um, Jack was relatively drowsy. He was in shock. They'd given him a lot of pain medication. Um, and he was just, he just kept mumbling, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I look back at it and kind of accept that there was depression there and accept the fact that I didn't deal with it the right way. My competitive side of me definitely come out and I'm like, I need to be able to accomplish everything and everything um, before I leave hospital. Well done, Jack. Sitting up in bed. Rehab was a really hard time. I was on bed for six weeks and then did six weeks of rehab at hospital. The physio side of things was a real mental struggle for me to be able to accept that I wouldn't be able to walk, but I also couldn't do what he was telling me straight away and that it was going to take time for me to learn. Because I seen him do it, I was just like, if he can do it, then surely I'm not that disabled, I can do that myself. So I kind of wanted to be able to prove to myself that it was still doable. And it was like seeing steps in the gym and being like, I've got to be able to get up these steps, otherwise how am I going to get around and get into people's houses and stuff like that? So when I come back from Christchurch, um, after my hospital treatment there, I come back just before Christmas and self-admitted myself to the mental health ward at the hospital here. Basically just to ensure that I was safe so I didn't have to have my family worry about it. My dad wanted me to go back and live with him, and that's what I was going to do just because I, I thought that's what I had to do. And then I realised if I was to do that there, I wouldn't have a job anymore. I wouldn't have any normality, like nothing would have been the same. It would have, everything would have changed because of my disability. Whereas I wanted things to feel like home and like normal. It took a while, but I knew that I had to do something to keep me active in order to keep my mental health in a better state. Because if I didn't work, I would have just been sitting in my room dwelling the whole time um, and just ruminating things in my head um, and thinking of the worst situation. Whereas work kind of gave me the opportunity to get out of the house and go do something active and challenge me a bit more. We were the same as probably most people, that you, you think, oh, you know, people in wheelchairs, not being able to walk is the biggest hurdle. Um, but we quickly found that not being able to work, walk is, is such a minor thing. Like, it's the other stuff. It's, you know, learning how to do your daycare, you know, your toilets and that sort of stuff is more of a um, disability than actually walking. Quickly realise there's, there's the mental recovery of having a major um, you know, being having a major disability as well as the mental recovery that's necessary from suicide. Um, and you sort of, you know, in his case, he had them both at once. Um, but I mean, we sort of, we thought that um, having, having a work distraction or something to do um, was going to be good for him in that, you know, especially that first 12 months. We had to instigate a lot of rules and boundaries that perhaps we'd never had to previously in our, the dynamic of our entire relationship, especially for that first year, changed to full-time parents of, um, I say a child, even though he was 18, um, that was no longer able to take, 
not take care of themselves. When I say that, people think around the, the wheelchair and the paraplegia, but was not mentally able to take care of themselves or keep themselves safe. It's been an, an opportunity, I think, for Ian to learn more around the emotional side of things as well. Um, and to, to a certain extent, rather than just wait for what feels like the perfect opportunity to go and connect with someone to, to create that opportunity, which is perhaps, you know, I think perhaps we're all guilty of that, that we wait for the perfect time instead of just creating it. Lily. Jack's real good at figuring out how shit works in terms of, um, you know, like if you've got a problem like the, say, that, for instance, this here, you've got to do things in a certain order to get this off the float and then to put the float back together, like the thing that floats on back together, you have to do that a certain way around as well. He's good at figuring that sort of shit out and I'm not, so it's easier just to get him to go out there and tell me. Ah, uh, if he says that, then it must be true. Plenty of stuff I'd say it's not true, remember? <laughs> yeah, but I mean, in terms of figuring shit out, you've got to make yeah. it better, better than I am. Yeah. When, something, when you go through something like this, you always ask yourself questions about, you know, what could I have done differently or should I have known or should I have been able to stop it? Um, you know, would it have been the right thing to do to stop it? Um, and, and I mean, at the time, it's, you know, it's a terrible thing to go through and I wouldn't wish it on anyone, but it's, it's also um, part of the process to get to a point where you can just say, no, I've, you know, the only person that made that decision was Jack. I think the point was when I realised I could either blame myself forever, that I'm in this situation now and I chose this life, or I could be like, accept it and be like, you've, you've made a mistake and it's time to move on. To start with, I really worried about what people thought of me and it was really because I wasn't happy in myself. After I kind of accepted that, yeah, I just, I kind of just go out and if people want to stare, they can stare, but I don't really take that on at all anymore. And I don't really let anyone judge me in a way that will affect me. I understand that it's, that I'm different, but I don't think disabled is the right word for it. Things just take longer sometimes, or things are a bit harder, but if you surround yourself by the right people, nothing's a problem as such. For men, it's kind of, you've got that reputation of being um, strong and kind of being there for anyone, um, but also, you have to be able to look after yourself. And now I look at somebody and I think that they're stronger if they're able to accept something like that or able to ask for help. Um, it's not a weakness at all. Now, especially with Leanne and Ian and my dad, I think we're a lot more open about how we're feeling. Um, and we've kind of learnt to talk about our feelings definitely a lot more. My dad came down to Christchurch and stayed there for six, the first six weeks. It was a weird feeling. I hadn't really seen my dad show too much emotion or affection as such in his life. And then for him to be sad and upset like that was really hard, but kind of created a, a bond as such and something for us to work from, yeah. We've had a little bit of a talk and I think, yeah, he, he kind of blames himself for not doing enough, um, as what he says. He didn't do enough when, he was, when I was younger um, and he blames himself for that. Um, after that month on Girlwood, that, that night, some of them are hard to look at. I think October 2014 was probably the hardest month of my life as a parent. We've talked about about um, the crash and, and the 
the outcome of it and the reasons for it. It's either going to wreck your life or it's going to make something better. And I think mindset is a big thing. You know, Jack has his ups and downs, but he's he's had some highs, you know, with Halberg Sports and uh, wheelchair basketball and cycling and whatever. And I hope he gets back into that sort of thing. It's hard to talk about, but I think if, if we do it, it might make it easier for someone else, and that's why I'm here. That and to support him, obviously. And that's the spine. What goes through your mind as a parent is, um, you know, that'll never leave me, driving to Burwood every day and sitting in the car park for however long it took to compose myself to make sure that the face Jack got to see was, was of his loving dad who was there to help him through that day. Look at how cute William is. Does he have overalls on? Seeing some of the images is pretty hard, um, especially the x-rays. It's kind of opens my eyes a lot to it as well, though. So that's why I say if we can share the story and, and make one person stop and think, then that might be a good time to stop and think and phone your, phone your dad and say, Dad, I need help. Eh. Definitely. And he did. He texts me. And I read his text and I tried phoning him four times. And then I got the bystander that pulled him out on the phone. Um, hey. So thanks to him. I didn't realise that he was on the phone to a bystander. Um, so that's, that's quite hard for me to hear. Um, and just thinking of how hard that would have been. Um, so yeah, that's quite hard, to be honest. Uh, just the effect that it's had on my family. Um, it's definitely not what I wanted. Um, and it's hard to know that I've heard them like that. Um, they all mean so much to me. Um, and it sucks to know that I'd have to just put them in that position. Um, it's, it's hard. Got a lot of people that love him, though, eh? Hey, Jack Rubius. Definitely a big change in my mental health, just getting out of the house and doing something social with people. Um, and it's kind of a good excuse to get me out of bed because it was something I really enjoyed and something that I was passionate about. So to meet other people that were in the same boat, it was, it was real cool. Definitely helped a lot. Hard out athlete on his bike and shit. And now he's, um, yeah, he's the face in the middle, he's sweet as. Yeah. He's a skinny little runt though. Now he's like, obviously he's got decent arms in it. Obviously, you've got to pull yourself around and shit's pretty hard out. You know, until you actually see him doing it. I wouldn't be able to drag myself up and, you know, climb in here and do all that. I'll be a mission, but if you have to, you have to. And he has to. So he's just got used to it. And he makes it look like as easy as it is for us for walking and opening in the door, you know, whatever. I've blocked two beds, you know. It's nice nice night or something. I look back at myself a couple of years ago, two, three years ago, and I and I compared to now when I took me a while to kind of understand that I was in that place. A self-love kind of thing, you kind of gotta accept that and kind of move on. Basically, I'm gonna strive for the best, best possible um, and try and make the most of every opportunity that I have. Probably the biggest thing is that it's okay not to be okay um, and that there is an option out there for you um, and it's not going to get handed to you and it's not going to be easy but 
if you ask for help, the help will be there. And yeah, it's not gonna change overnight, but if you work towards it and see the end goal, you'll get there. Attitude was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.